Valerie Benker, who's going to be talking about the challenges to behavioural change to benefit wildlife conservation, a case study in um, La La Kipia, Kenya. Hi there. Um, I'm project manager for the Alliance for Contraception and Cats and Dogs, but today I'll be switching species entirely and discussing uh, challenges to behavioral change to benefit wildlife conservation through a case study of Laikipia, Kenya. The human dimension of wildlife conservation in Laikipia it has long focused on problems with Maasai and Samburu pastoralist communities. Working with um, individuals from these communities, I interviewed several dozen uh, Maasai pastoralists as part of my thesis research. And drawing from those interviews, as well as from conversations with other stakeholders and a literature review, I'll talk about some challenges and gaps in how human wildlife coexistence problems are being defined and addressed in Lycopia's pastoral communities. These challenges and gaps affect capacity for behavioral change now, I believe, and will continue to affect capacity into the future. Of equal importance, I'll also talk about some of the challenges surrounding the stakeholders who hold power and authority in the region, since that's um, a key part of this story. So the plan um, for the talk is us. I'll start by giving a bit of background on Lycopia, and then I'll turn to three key challenges to fostering behavior change. And lastly, I'll offer some closing thoughts. It will be an abbreviated discussion of some complex issues, but I hope that it provides a sense of key challenges with human behavior change, um, which may well also have implications or applications to other communities. Lycopia County is widely hailed as a conservation success as it contains tremendous numbers and varieties of wildlife, including several threatened and endangered species. Not surprisingly, the district highlights its conservation ethic and the regional, regional economy is incredibly dependent on wildlife tourism. Geographically, Lycopia has forest reserves, government land, farms, private pro-wildlife ranches belonging largely to white Kenyans and expats, and group ranches that have been established for pastoral um, people. The two stars um, in the pink section uh, denote the group ranches where I conducted interviews. And it's important to just be clear that all of these different interests and livelihoods are stakeholders in the community. As of a few years ago, 20% of residents own 74% of land in Lycopia. Maasai and Samburu residents living on group ranches are generally and lack services that most others in the county enjoy. The livelihoods and identity of pastoralists living on group ranches are inextricably entwined with animal husbandry, namely raising cattle, goats, and sheep, oftentimes referred to as shoats, and increasingly camels. The role that these species play in people's lives really cannot be overstated, and the photos on your left uh, hopefully convey just a small glimpse of this. The consistent density of um, domestic animals, however, leads to overgrazing on group lands, a bit of which can be seen in the photos on your right. Overgrazing limits attractiveness to wildlife, which is a problem, particularly because group ranches and pastoral lands are part of wildlife migration corridors and important to a large-scale, contiguous, wildlife-friendly landscape. And also of key relevance for this talk, within Lycopia County, pastoral communities are widely perceived as antagonistic toward wildlife. So here we have the combination of overgrazing and the belief among more powerful players in the region that pastoralists are antagonistic towards wildlife. This has prompted investments to change pastoralist choices and behaviors to ones that are more wildlife friendly. Sponsored initiatives include wildlife and cultural tourism on group ranches, establishing wildlife preserves within group ranches, encouraging livelihoods other than livestock raising, one example being beekeeping, and reducing human wildlife conflict. Many of these strategies and efforts have really faltered. Some facilities created with foreign funds are now essentially defunct, for example, and profits from ventures have not been equally distributed among community members, and group lands on the whole remain overgrazed. 
So turning to challenges. The first one that I'll talk about is a narrow and predetermined conception of what conflict entails. As a precursor to shifting attitudes and resulting behavior, it's necessary to understand why people feel the way they do. In this context, understanding people's um, attitudes means opening up dialogue and definitions of conflict in a way that invites the population of interest, in this case pastoral communities, to talk about the full breadth of challenges they face, including those vis-a-vis -vis wildlife. In reviewing human wildlife conflict literature from Lycipia, uh, depredation, human injury or death, damage to infrastructure or property, and crop rating have been the only things measured for decades, both um, in official county records as well as in independent research. There's clearly good reason why these measures constitute human wildlife conflict, but I think there's an important question here of who defines the sources of conflict that are being recorded and whether causes of conflict may change or evolve over time, particularly now that there is pressure to encourage wildlife on group ranches. In this particular region, for example, domestic animal species on ranches are shifting quite dramatically in response to environmental conditions, drought, and what I learned through interviews was a perceived increase in disease and mortality among domestic animals. My interviews with community members revealed that while perceptions of zoonotic disease were not the main reason why some pastoralists had mixed or negative feelings about accommodating wildlife on their land, it definitely played a role. There is also frustration with the fact that veterinary professionals only come to group ranches during outbreaks of foot and mouth disease. People felt that there was no interest in managing the two diseases that were most important to their animals and their livelihoods, which were contagious caprine pleural pneumonia and anaplasmosis. In short, there's a schism um, in priorities of different stakeholders and no indications of resolution. In addition to disease, there may very well be more other, other more insidious sources of human wildlife uh, friction that will not be captured and therefore cannot be addressed with current mechanisms for evaluating human wildlife tensions or conflict. In short, understanding challenges requires asking non-prescriptive questions and keeping an open dialogue. In order to develop strategies to shift attitudes towards wildlife and promote coexistence, it's also necessary to identify which, if any, animals are problem species. Much, much research in Lycipia has focused on three charismatic species, lions, elephants, and African wild dogs. Currently active programs and interventions to protect wildlife disproportionately emphasize conflict between pastoralists and lions, with the claim of benefiting <coughs> pastoralists' lives through initiatives to mitigate conflict and by extension change human behavior. While programs to address human-lion conflict are without question focused exclusively on the species don't appear to truly reflect uh, the concerns of pastoralists, but rather reflect the interests of conservationists, researchers, and tourists. When I asked community residents about their experience with predators, spotted hyenas were cited most often as killing livestock, twice as often as the leopard, which was the next most often mentioned predator. <coughs> excuse me, lions were virtually absent from discussion. Moreover, both my interviews and other studies in the area have found a level of animosity towards hyenas on community lands that doesn't seem to jive with their perceived threat. This clearly presents a challenge when some of the species that are most problematic from the standpoint of um, the most vulnerable stakeholders are not ones with much potential to bring to bring in tourism or funding dollars. However, if only in the interest of building trust, I think it's really quite vital to demonstrate interest and effort in promoting coexistence with the species of greatest concern to the most vulnerable people. <clears throat> Lastly, I'll speak to social, cultural, and historical considerations. To date, Conservation advocates have focused on technical and economic solutions to conflict resolution and overgrazing in Lycipia, including building more effective predator and elephant fencing and establishing alternative livelihoods for people. 
as the head of a Lycipia lion conservation project puts it, quote, as pastoralists increasingly engage in a cash economy, they have lost their tolerance of predators and are likely to continue eliminating lions unless lions bring in financial benefits that outweigh costs. One of the major challenges of these technical solutions, at least in Lycipia, is that benefits are not equally distributed among community members. This really harms prospects for sustainability. A more fundamental issue, though, is that the focus on the technical solutions can come at the expense of considering social and cultural factors that are part of human-wildlife relationships. In Lycipia, there are relatively limited pastoralist voices in research on strategies for human-wildlife conflict and coexistence. Um, sorry, human-wildlife coexistence. In fact, in the communities where I spent time, I was only the second or third researcher to come and talk to people, although for years the research center where I was based had sent people to the group branches to, to perform ecological research. And not surprisingly, when I did speak with people, the sense of injustice and loss of rightful ownership to land came through loud and clear. An attachment to land once belonging to ancestors was felt by youth living on the group ranches today. Discussion of cultural and historical loss tend to be repressed in ecologically oriented discussions of and plans for wildlife conservation. In a best case scenario, community conservation and wildlife tourism would offset economic losses associated with supporting large populations of wildlife on pastoral lands. However, even this best case scenario could not um, mitigate feelings of historic loss and injustice, nor could it address some of the more tangible consequences of greater human-wildlife interaction in the present day. <clears throat> so, turning to conclusions, um, clearly this presentation is not a success story about human behavior change. And it goes without saying that while it's easy to point out challenges and limitations to current approaches, it's far more difficult to come up with solutions. That said, I'll try to summarize um, some general ideas. First, um, there's a need to revisit reasons for struggles with wildlife through a broader lens within this community including getting at the more subtle factors that could influence human attitudes and behavior. <clears throat> this means truly talking with average people in pastoral communities, not just chiefs and those in positions of relative power and affluence. Second, there's a need to revisit species of conflict and better align at least some initiatives with species that pose the greatest problems for humans. Related to this point is the fact that charismatic species are getting the vast majority of attention from researchers, conservationists, and tourists. This no doubt stems in part from funding channels and priorities, those, priorities of those with relative power and resources. Hence, there's certainly potential for human behavior change here, even if it doesn't entail turning spotted hyenas into the next hot uh, species for wildlife tourism. <laughs> Third point um, is that history and context matter. A pervasive sense of historic loss and injustice and generations of, wildlife, of livestock raising may not be changed through the promise of wildlife tourism. The reality of unequal distribution of resources does not help. This isn't to suggest becoming entrapped by history, but simply to acknowledge it and not to ignore it at the expense of exclusively ecological and economic solutions. And fourth, um, simple narratives about human behavior are attractive, but they're also risky. And this includes, but is not limited to, the common narrative in Lycipia that pastoralists are antagonistic toward wildlife and central to problems with wildlife conservation. There's a lot of complexity that must be teased apart and danger in oversimplifying the story. Thank you.